Heavenly Father, we love thee, we praise thee, and we adore thee. Grant that we, your church, may glorify thy name in all the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. In our gospel passage today, Jesus asked Simon Peter the most important question that any of us will ever answer in the course of our lifetimes. It is indeed the preeminent question for all of humanity. Who do you say that I am? Or rather, who do you say that Jesus is? The answer, likewise, is the most important answer any of us will ever have to give. It is the answer upon which all matters of temporal and eternal significance are predicated. You, Jesus, are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let us keep this in mind as we reflect on today's scripture readings and always through the course of our lives. Our first reading from Isaiah chapter 51 provides the perfect backdrop to our gospel reading from Matthew 16. They complement each other very well. And the prophet gives us a powerful encouragement. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden. God comforts those who pursue righteousness. And when we last read this lectionary, Three years ago now, can you believe that? We were going through our own waste places, were we not? We were sitting and had been sitting in the Deacon the Stomberg's backyard for the course of the summer. The world was in turmoil. It still is, but it was turmoil afresh. We didn't know what was going on or where things were heading. In many ways, both individually and collectively as the big C church, we had to wander through different waste places for the better part of two years. We saw churches closed, people denied the sacraments, family members kept from sick and dying loved ones, in unprecedented attacks on race relations and medical freedom, and even the very meaning of what it means to be a human being. Every one of us, in different ways, wander through the desert in one way or another. Paul writes in chapter 11 of his letter to the Romans, Oh, the depth and of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Were we not tempted as we always are when things don't go our way to appoint ourselves counselor, advice giver to God. How quickly we try to give God advice when we find that we are ourselves in a desolate place. As if we know his mind. Hey God, knock knock, this whole disease and civilizational unrest thing, it's not really working out for me right now. My life's hard now. Maybe... You can try something else. And yet here we are today, the people of God still gathered together and in one piece, worshiping Lord Jesus Christ in word and sacrament. Three years ago, when perhaps it felt like you were stuck living in the movie Groundhog Day, when your life felt as though it were caught in the fog of a bad dream, it seemed as though there would never be an end, didn't it? The waste places looked like they would stretch on forever. But God was and is with his people. And he has brought us to a point, I think, for many unimaginable just a few years ago. And we can now look back and close one chapter of our lives while we are looking forward into the next. This is how the seasons of life go. And this is not to say that the church does not face many of the same problems, but that Jesus Christ is there to guide her forward as the head. 
But this is the case in every difficult season. In this early chapter of Isaiah, from what we read last week, the Lord is speaking through the prophet to the Israelites in Babylonian exile. Our previous reading was to the Israelites in post-captivity. Here they are in captivity in Babylon. How is that for a waste place? The Lord tells them, You who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Remember that Abraham and Sarah could not have children until God visited Abraham as an old, old man. God reminds the Israelites that he brought them forth from this one barren couple, making the dependents and the descendants of Abraham as numerous as the stars in the sky. God did not bring his people forth from fertile soil, but he dug us out from a salty, dry quarry, carving us out of the rock. If he could do that, God says, then why can't he make his people's desert like the Garden of Eden? Beloved, when God's people pursue righteousness, then he will fill us with joy in the midst of a barren wasteland. The Lord builds upon his argument a few verses later in verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment. And they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation is forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Now, I have a few t-shirts that I really like. They're comfy. I wear them around the house a lot. I like to wear them going for runs and when I work out. And I would say I take pretty good care of them. I really like them, so I don't treat them too heavily, but after a few years, I'm noticing that holes are starting to show up in random places that don't even make sense most of the time, but I don't recall getting poked or caught by anything sharp when I'm wearing these, but the holes appear anyway. No matter how much I like the shirt, no matter how much I cling to these articles of clothing, after years and years, it wears out anyway. The earth will wear out like a garment. So no matter how much we may cling to this mortal coil, to the things, the possessions that we like, no matter how much we say or pretend or ignore it, the world will pass away, just as you and I will pass away if the Lord tarries. Popular culture would have us cope by living in the moment, as I'm sure you've heard many times. But if we agree with St. Peter, in today's gospel passage that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, then as Christians, we should not be living for today, for the moment, but for eternity. Living in the moment doesn't get you far because the present is the present for only a moment, and then it is the past. This is the same is true for all the other promises given to you by those who would say Jesus is anything other than the son of the living God. We're fast coming up on everybody's favorite season, of course, election season. (laughs) And with it, a lot of politicians are going to make a lot of empty promises in order to gain or to stay in office, but all our earthly rulers and the promises they make are like smoke. Their promises will dissipate into thin air, and today's rulers will soon fade like the grass. And before we know it, they will become the rulers of the past. God's righteousness, on the other hand, will never be dismayed. It will never be disturbed. God always keeps his promises. And he has promised to comfort and preserve his people, the church, 
built on the rock until the end of the age. Seasons will change. Kings and presidents will come and go, but God will always be there to comfort the waste places of Zion. Even as a spiritual desert of 20 and 20 and onward was made green for God's faithful, so too will your present waste places be turned into Eden if you persist in the righteousness of God. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly, the psalmist says today. He perceives the haughty from afar. Though the Lord sits enthroned as king above all, he sits as king over the flood, as we heard in recent weeks, he cares for his people. Even at the same time, the haughty, the prideful, are far from him. They remove themselves from him, and so he merely looks upon them. If, in the midst of the desert, we spurn the Lord and try to offer him our own counsel, then we will continue to wander through the wastes. Let us return once more to the gospel passage. Jesus and the disciples, since we last saw them by the coast of Tyre and Sidon have since traveled back through Israel, first stopping at the Sea of Galilee and now into the district of Caesarea Philippi. This is another place like Tyre and Sidon with deep pagan roots and is located about 20 miles north of the Sea of Galilee on the extreme northern border of Israel. It is there that Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? The disciples answered, Well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. They were recounting many of these popular opinions at the time. Now here's a rhetorical question for us. Do you think Jesus was trying to learn something by asking this question? No, of course not. Is Jesus, he knew what the answer was. He knew what the public thought of him. He knew what the crowds thought of him. He and the disciples by now have fed the multitudes with loaves and fish, right? And every time that they encounter these crowds, they only see them disperse after they've had their meal. Their answer is not a surprise to Jesus. If you ask 100 different people who Jesus is, you're likely to receive a hundred different answers. Many of them along the lines of, well, Jesus was a nice person. He was something of a prehistoric hippie. He just wanted us to be nice to each other. But this is the point that Jesus is trying to impress upon the disciples. Jesus' identity is not determined by public opinion. And from this, we know the Christian faith is not determined by surveys or majority votes. No, Jesus' identity is constant, and Christian truth is constant. The apostles, Jesus warns, are not to look to public opinion for true faith. So Jesus asks them a follow-up question. But who do you say that I am? And of course, who is there to answer but Peter? Ready to answer, always the one saying what everyone else perhaps has on their minds but is too afraid to speak. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Ding, 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 the bells go off, right? Flashing lights come out, confetti drops down. Correct, Simon Peter. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, Jesus answered, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, who is in heaven. Jesus' answer demonstrates that the faith of the church is given by God, the Father of Jesus Christ, and it is not an invention of human cleverness, which is a great challenge for us to grasp. We, like the crowds, we want to make Jesus into whoever is most convenient for us, whatever is going to satisfy our most immediate needs. Wouldn't it be so much easier if we could just put the Christian faith up to a poll, we say, and determine it that way? How much more equitable that would be. But at that point, 
you no longer have faith, but rather a public relations campaign. The one true faith, guarded by the church, will never be dismayed. Public opinion will always vanish like smoke. Jesus goes on, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is here that Simon receives his new name from Jesus, Petros, and in the Greek, Kepa, literally, rock. Jesus says, Simon, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. St. Peter, as a leader of the apostles and witness to Jesus Christ as the cornerstone, would be the solid foundation of Christ's church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This translation is a bit misleading. Jesus does not mean hell as in going to heaven or hell after you die, the two places that we think about. Better it is to call it the gates of Hades, the abode of the dead, or the gates of death, which shall not prevail against it. We also misunderstand, aside from that, what Jesus is saying here. When you hear this verse and compare it to the spread of evil throughout the world, throughout human history, well, what do you think of? Well, we know the church is engaged in spiritual warfare and in spiritual combat, right? We know that God's people are fighting the works of sin and their lives by the Holy Spirit. Do you not think of the church as being under attack by the forces of darkness, trying to defend against it? Sure, I think we are all inclined to think that, but that is entirely the wrong picture. When you see the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, well, what are gates for? Well, they're used for defending a walled city against attack. They're used as a point of entry, and in times of war, the gates are closed to prevent entry. Nobody attacks with gates. You're not picking up the gates and using them to hit people with. The image that Jesus gives, then, is not one of a church on the defense, but one on the attack against death itself. Sure, sin and death will always launch desperate attacks against the church, but that is exactly because they are being defeated by Christ at the head of the charge. Death will never overpower the church. Even within the walled city of Hades, the gates will never close upon it, for Christ broke them when he died and rose again on the third day. Finally, Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, the authority exercised by the church on earth will also be confirmed in heaven. And how is that authority exercised? It is through the authoritative teaching of God's word and the exercise of church discipline, namely excommunication. The church is the custodian of God's truth. Therefore, because God's truth endures forever, he will preserve his remnant people to whom he has entrusted it. Let us thank God for keeping us safe in the midst of trouble. And let us not forget how he comforted us in our waste places in the past. Perhaps today you still find yourself navigating the wilderness, whether now or in the future, when we wander through those desolate places. We must never forsake to answer the question that matters most. Who do you say that Jesus is? And the answer will be one of two things. Is Jesus the one who public opinion says he is or who you want him to be? Or is Jesus who he says he is, the great I am, the son of the living God, as Peter confessed? 
If Christ is denied, then we deny human dignity, we deny the truth, and we deny any hope of true joy. If we stand with St. Peter, on the other hand, then even in the midst of trouble, joy and gladness will be found in us. Beloved, the church in every generation has had to navigate the wilderness, and the Lord has always been there to comfort her. For those who answer this most important question correctly. Lord, we worship you and give you praise tonight because of your love and faithfulness and your love which endures forever. For you have glorified your name and your word above all things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.